the integumentary system, which is our skin. The integumentary system is what covers our body. It includes not just skin, although that's what we're going to be looking at, but it also includes your hair and nails. Some stats, you have approximately 18 square feet of skin that cover the average adult. The average thickness is about one-eighth of an inch. Now, it's going to vary according to where on the body. On the body. You know where the thinnest, uh, one of the places that are thinnest, our, our skin is thinnest? It's actually your eyelid. The weight, again, varies, but the average weight of an adult is about six to nine pounds. If you want to know what the weight of your skin is on your body, it's about 6% of your body weight. So just take your weight and multiply it by 0 0.06, and that will tell you approximately how much your skin weighs. Now you need to know for the quiz that the skin is the largest organ of the human body largest one. Second largest is your liver. You don't need to know any of this for a quiz or test, but it's just to give you <clears throat> the remarkable um, the remarkable way that God puts so much into our skin. So if you take a piece of skin <clears throat> about the size of a quarter, you would find inside of it one yard of blood vessels, four yards of nerves, 25 nerve endings. Now that would change according to where you took the skin from because those vary. About a hundred sweat glands and more than three million cells all fitting into a piece of skin the size of a quarter. Now the functions you need to know, <clears throat> there's several functions and we're going to look at how these are functions of the skin protection, sensory response, temperature regulator, excretion, manufacturing, and absorbing. Protection is one of the key things that we think about with our skin. It's actually a mechanical shield. It's keeping out things that should stay out and keeping things in that should stay in. It's helping our organs inside not to dry out. That's what's keeping moisture in. It's also keeping harmful um, <clears throat> in, or not insects, but harmful organisms like bacteria that could hurt you out. So your skin is one of your m body's major defenses. It's actually your first line of defense. And the skin does not permit significant amounts of substances like water in or out of your body and it keeps your body from drying out. Bacteria, viruses, and, and many common chemicals that you constantly touch would be very harmful if they penetrated into the body. But your skin's going to be that shield that keeps them out. So it's an effective barrier to most of them. Another thing that your skin does, <clears throat> the perspiration that, which we'll be talking about, which is the sweat, and the oil that is secreted by your skin, parts of your skin, they pro provide you with a chemical pro uh, protection. It's actually a little acidic and sometimes it has enzymes in it that would inhibit the growth of certain kinds of microorganisms like some of the bad bacteria. Sensory response, you have sensory receptors. These sensory receptors <clears throat> are at the end of nerves they're called nerve receptors or sensory receptors. You have some for pressure, you have some for temperature, you have some for pain. Without them, you would not feel these things. You would not know if, you know, you wouldn't be chilly if you didn't have the ones for temperature. You wouldn't feel pain. You wouldn't know that your hand is on a, like a hot stove without your pain receptors. So <clears throat> they are in your skin. And what they're doing is they're communicating, and that's chemically and electronically, they communicate to your body the outside world that it is living in. The more sensory receptors that you have in a particular area of your skin, the more sensitive it is. So they're not evenly distributed throughout your whole body. There's certain areas that God made them have a lot more receptors to be a lot more 
sensitive. <clears throat> temperature regulators. One thing that regulates the temperature is actually the blood vessels that are in your skin. And they can either dilate or they can constrict, which is going to then help regulate the temperature of the blood which goes around and then would help regulate the temperature of your body. So the amount of blood being carried to the surface of your skin is regulated to control the amount of thermal energy that is released. Now if your blood vessels dilate, they get larger when you need to cool off. So that way, see, more blood would be exposed to your skin and at the, at the same time, you would also be sweating, and sweating, when it evaporates, it cools you. And so it's going to be cooling not only your skin, but the blood underneath. Now, if it's cold outside, then your blood doesn't want to dilate the blood vessels because it wants to conserve that thermal energy and have it go to your organs. So then your blood vessels constrict and get smaller, so not as much is going to be exposed in your skin uh, to cool off. Excretion, technically probably the better way to say this is secretion, because excretion means getting rid of waste, and it's actually one of the systems that we'll be studying in another chapter. But in your sweat, there is a small amount of body waste that is excreted with the sweat. And that body waste is cell waste. And it's the same cell waste, it's called urea, which is in urine. Uh, now, obviously, you cannot not go to the bathroom and still live. You have to get rid of, you know, a majority of the cell waste is not going to be getting rid, you know, your skin can't get rid of it. It can only get rid of a small amount. So your excretory system, really your kidneys are made to do that. But there is urea, which is <clears throat> in urine, is also in your sweat. <clears throat> so sweat glands, they move moisture to the surface. One is to cool it. The other is to give off waste. And remember that sometimes it may be acidic and so forth to help uh, the bacteria to stop them from growing. Now the oil glands, which are around the hair follicles, which we'll look at, they're called technically sebaceous glands. And whenever you do lab, make sure you use the technical name, sebaceous, land, uh, sebaceous glands, not oil glands. And they coat the skin. So they're not only coating the hair, they're coating your skin with oils, which is helping it to not dry out. Now your skin also manufactures a vitamin. And the vitamin, of course, we've talked about is vitamin D. Your skin has the ability to produce small amounts of vitamin D if it gets sufficient sunlight. If it doesn't get sufficient sunlight, then it cannot manufacture the vitamin D. And what is sufficient? You need about 15 to 20 minutes, two to three times a week. And that would be sufficient for your body to make the amount of vitamin D that you need. And remember, vitamin D is very important in our uh, strength of our bones because it's what helps to absorb the calcium and the phosphorus, which is in our bones. Absorption. The skin can absorb some chemicals and a few drugs and small amounts of oxygen. Again, we cannot live without our lungs. We don't get enough oxygen through our skin, not like a frog. A frog gets a lot of oxygen through the skin and it can get oxygen uh, from the water. That's why it can go underwater and stay under there because its skin is richly lined with a whole bunch of blood vessels and it can get its oxygen that way. We get small amounts. Now it can absorb chemicals and that's why it's very important to make sure whenever you're using a product that you read the caution label. And if it says wear protective clothing, wear gloves, don't expose your skin to that, a substance, then you make sure you do that because <clears throat> they know that there's something harmful that will and can be absorbed by your skin. And so they're telling you to wear protective clothing so you don't get that absorbed. 
Uh, we know some benefits from this is when a person wears a patch. Like they have the patch, you know, for seasickness that you put behind your ear. There's hormone patches, and then there's also patches when people are trying to get off of cigarettes, and they take nicotine patches, and they'll wear those. And the reason that works is because the skin will absorb the drugs that are in that patch. <clears throat> All right, the layers of the skin. Be able to list the three layers of the skin. The epidermis is the top. Epi means above. The dermis is the middle, and then underneath, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is the hypodermis. Hypo means under. <coughs> the epidermis. You need to know that it's the outermost layer of the skin, and when you look at, and the epidermis really has several layers. So if you look in the textbook or online to get some of the answers for your lab, you're going to find some of those names. And when you look at the different layers of the epidermis, the very top layer, the layer that we see, the layer that we touch and feel, that layer is dead skin cells. That's it. They're dead. What happens is <clears throat> underneath, when your new cells are being made, and that too is your epidermis. It's the living layer of your epidermis. It makes the new skin cells. And when it makes new skin cells, they are then, of course, going to be at the bottom. And as they age, they're going to move their way up to the top, to the epidermis, up to, well, it is the epidermis, but up to the top of the epidermis where we see them. It takes about 25 days uh, for that to happen. So it's actually about every 25 days you have a new layer of skin on the outside, a new dead layer of skin. What happens when these skin cells age, they start filling up with a waxy substance. And that waxy substance is called keratin. So as they're aging and as they're dying, they're going to have more keratin in them. They do not um, contain, the epidermis doesn't, your nerve endings and so forth. It might have some pain receptors in it. But the blood vessels and all those things and a lot of the pressure and other things, they're not in the epidermis. That's why you can see somebody stick a little needle right through the epidermis and there's no blood. That's because there's no blood vessels in the epidermis. The epidermis also produces a substance called melanin. There are special cells in the epidermis that do that, which are called melanocytes. And that's a pigment. That's what colors your skin. It's also what protects your body by absorbing sun, some of the sun's damaging ultraviolet rays. And so that's why when you're out in the sun that your body tans. That tanning is actually the production of melanin. And it's trying to protect you from those damaging ultraviolet lights. The dermis, which is under the epidermis, is much thicker and it has a lot more things. It's also what gives your skin its strength and it nourishes it and makes it very flexible. And it's what contains your connective tissues, your blood vessels, your nerve endings, the sweat glands are down there, the hair follicles are down there, the oil glands, the sebaceous glands are all in the dermis. The hypodermis is fat cells. So it consists of loosely arranged fat cells. Now remember, fat cells are yellow, and fat cells store fat. So one of their jobs is to store energy. But another reason <coughs> is why we have this layer is to cushion our organs and to insulate them, to keep our body temperature inside what it needs to be so that the organs can function. Remember, this is homeostasis. So here's some of the parts that you can see. <clears throat> you will have to label a diagram on the next quiz that we have. So the next quiz will be over the notes and the diagram because there's not as many things to label. And where it says fatty layer there, you would put the hypodermis. Skin color. Now I was talking about melanin. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. But whenever you see pink, you know, like blushing and so forth, 
that's when a person's skin's the blood is showing through. So like the blood vessels are dilating or coming uh, close and you see the pinkish color. But the other colors that we have, the darker skin colors, the uh, yellowish skin colors, the Asians, uh, is because of pigments. The dark color, the blacks, the browns, that's melanin. And the more melanin you have, the darker the skin. And remember, melanin is a protection against the ultraviolet light of the sun. So you actually have a built-in more, you know, uh, built-in sun lotion on you with the dark pigments because of the melanin. The yellowish pigment is carotene. So that should be easy, although you think of carrots being orange, but it's the yellowish kind of uh, color. And different amounts of that makes all the different shades of color. And then those that are real pale, like my skin is pretty white, um, <clears throat> that's because I do not have much melanin. But one place I do have melanin is, <clears throat> well, first let's look at the special cells. Melanin is produced by these special cells called melanocytes. And uh, when you look at a person's skin, and when we look at skin, I have some that is pigment, some that are pigmented and some that are not. The pigmented is one where there's a lot of melanin. So that would be more the brownish and darker brown colors of skin. Mine, <clears throat> I have freckles. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Freckles are <clears throat> when the melanin is compact in one area. There's just clumps of it. It's not evenly distributed through my skin. So when I go out in the sun, I get more freckles. I burn and freckle. That's what happens to me. So when my melanocytes produce the melanin, it's in little pockets, little clumps, and that's where my freckles are. Now let's look at some diseases and disorders, and we're going to look at these five, albinism, calluses, blisters, boils, and acne. And then we're going to look at also how our skin can be damaged by burns. Albinism is when our skin doesn't have the ability to make any melanin. So it has no melanin whatsoever. Thus, the skin can't tan, so it's very dangerous for an albino human to go out in the sun because they have no protection and their eyes are really sensitive and their eyes can be easily damaged so when they're out in the sun they wear shades they wear a hat they wear long sleeve clothing uh, to protect them a callus whenever you have friction that happens in a certain area. Let's say like you get some new shoes <clears throat> and there's friction and you got soreness in this one area. <clears throat> well, your body tries to protect that area by building up some cells, actually some dead cells, and it builds up what they call a callus. So it's a thickened epidermis and it's there to try to protect the tissues underneath from the friction that is happening. Now, when you have a blister, <clears throat> it's not a form of protection. It actually means that you've injured that part of the skin. When you get a blister, the friction was damaging part of the skin. And so that layer of skin, that top layer, actually separates. And then water and the fluids that surround your cells builds up in there. And that's what then makes the actual blister. A boil is where there's a bacterial infection. So that raised portion there, if you poke at it, a lot of pus would come out because that's what it's filled with. Pus is actually an indication that there's infection and your body is trying to heal uh, there. Acne. Acne is a skin condition that most people are familiar with because you suffer from maybe not severe like this poor person has. But pimples. You have a zit. <clears throat> you could also have a deeper lumps or cysts or nodules, and you can also have plugged pores, which are the blackheads and the whiteheads. And they occur, usually you see in the face, but they can also be on the neck, the chest, the back, shoulders, and even your upper arms. Common place that we see them, of course, is the face. 
there is three major factors on what causes acne. There's overproduction of oil because there's an enlarged sebaceous gland, an oil gland in the skin. Or there can be something that's blocking the hair follicle from releasing that oil. Or there can be a growth of bacteria within the hair follicle. And so those can be all different causes of acne. Now let's look at the burns. <clears throat> burns, you need to know, are classified by how deeply they penetrate the skin's surface. So they are classified as first degree, second degree, and third degree. Now remember how many layers of skin do we have? Three. So it should be easy to remember what a first degree, second degree, and third degree burn is. With the first degree, the burn only involves the epidermis, the first layer of skin. So first degree, first layer of skin, epidermis. Second degree burns involve not only the epidermis, but they also go into the second layer of skin, the dermis. So second degree, the burn goes all the way down into the dermis. So I guess you, I bet you can guess what the third one is. The third is when it destroys not only the epidermis, but it goes all the way through the dermis and into the subcutaneous layer, which is technically that hypo, um, <clears throat> the hypodermis. So it's also known as subcutaneous tissue. And it can, as you can see in the uh, picture, the diagram over there on the left, it actually can even go down into the muscle, and it's just barely touching muscle under the um, hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer. And so burns are classified, remember, as how deeply. So you can see the three here. First degree, first layer, epidermis. Second degree, two layers, the first and the second, epidermis and dermis. Third degree, all three layers, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. <clears throat>